the uh, um, chair in Christian theology and Pentecostal studies has a dual focus and that is also indicated in the title of my lecture. The uh, emphasis on theology shows my interest in the classical Christian teachings, whereas the emphasis on Pentecost shows my attention to what you might call the rebels of Christianity, the um, controversial charismatic and Pentecostal movements, only about a hundred years old, but which have already become the third largest stream of Christianity. I'm interested in how these new traditions speak to the classical Christian foundations and vice versa. So today I want to connect the emphasis on Christian theology and Pentecostal theology with primary intention in uh, what I have called the theological symbol of the Pentecostal movement, the day of Pentecost. My thesis, if you will, my argument is pretty straightforward. I argue that Christian theology has all but neglected Pentecost because we have distanced our theological behavior from the original event. What I will try to do is to trace the contours of this behavior at Pentecost and then show in the second part how we can relate Christian theology to the behavior that I want to uh, outline and therefore to the image of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost. If you're not familiar with this event, Pentecost, as you see in this picture from the 16th century, marks an unprecedented day in the history of Christianity. It is described in the New Testament as the fulfillment of the promise of God to pour out God's Spirit on all flesh. And this event of the outpouring of the Spirit is typically seen as the birthday of the church. Significantly, where the disciples of Christ still appear timid during their time with Jesus, the historical narrative of Pentecost shows a radically transformed Christian community. At Pentecost, the church emerges in an unexpected manner, astonishing, unpredictable, and unlike the way we find the disciples in the Gospels. Whereas just a few days prior, they still question Jesus' intention, with Pentecost emerges an unmistakable certitude, both in the content of the Christian teaching and in the manner of the presentation. In the biblical narrative, it is the physical character of the church's behavior, loud, boisterous, and according to the book of Acts, reminiscent of the sounds and sights of drunkenness, which attracts a large audience, understandably, and therefore makes room for theological debate. Beginning with Pentecost, the young church exhibits a striking behavior that is noticed, debated, and dismissed immediately. Nonetheless, unattracted and mystified by the Christian conduct on the day of Pentecost, the audience is led to receive the message of the Christian gospel. Not apart from or despite the behavior, but because of the behavior is the audience attracted. A closer look at the behavior of the Christian community shows the church with a distinct way to present its message, quick to speak and empowered to speak, all packaged in a behavior that according to the biblical records, bewildered, amazed, astonished, and perplexed, an audience labeled from every nation under heaven, in Jerusalem, a cosmopolitan city surely accustomed to unusual ways and drunkenness. Undoubtedly, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit brought certitude and clarity in terms of theological content. But the way this teaching is eventually expressed by the church and manifested by the disciples indicates that Pentecost marks also what we might call the birth of a Christian theological behavior. Despite the readily observable, distinctive way of the Christian community at Pentecost, there have been few attempts to connect the behavior of the church 
with the nature and content of Christian theology. Responsible for this neglect is the difficulty to categorize Pentecost beyond a mere historical attribute of the apostolic church also as constitutive of the Christian faith. Relegated to an event identified as the apostolic initiation of the church, Pentecost at the as the beginning of the Christian community holds little explanatory power from the continuing character of the church's and community's doctrine. As merely the first day of the church, Pentecost has led a peculiarly barren existence outside of the theological disciplines, irrelevant to their systematic and constructive formation, and consulted only to explain the origins of the church, but with no relation to the character and development of Christian teaching. The more theology became an organized discipline under post-Pentecost apologetics and catechetics, the more Pentecost was left to the distant origins of the apostolic ch church and community, or to revivalist groups or restorationist sects. This criticism has been embraced today with particular fervor by the global Pentecostal movements who trace their origin and name to the day of Pentecost. The experiences surrounding the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost form the model for practices and convictions multiplied and reshaped in diverse experiences of reliving Pentecost in the Pentecostal movements today. The aim of Pentecostal theology in this sense is participation in Pentecost. And the slogans of this theology that we find from the beginning of the movements are back to Pentecost or forward to Pentecost. But in any case, let's go to Pentecost. <laughs> and yet, Pentecostals have done little to tie this behavior to their own theological character and method. Following a history of rejection and isolation, the Pentecostal movements have spent more time emulating the established theological methodologies than to develop and understand their own peculiar Pentecostal behavior according to the way that they're named, namely Pentecost. The slogan, back to Pentecost, seems to have lost its sting in much of the West and the Northern Hemisphere, where formal Pentecostal theology has found increasing development. Oversaturated with claims of the supernatural, experiences that have shifted to the global south and to the east, and mixed with the fantastic and the unbelievable in an environment used to hyperbole and skepticism, but won't of miracles, Pentecost is simply incorporated into the nomenclature and modus operandi of a myriad of evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal-like churches, and thereby domesticated. Where back to Pentecost means only speak with tongues, or seek the miracle, or be prosperous, a confessional Pentecostal theology has degenerated into isolated practices at best, often an easy pick who wish, for those who wish to discredit the movements, or into an ideology at worst disconnected from the behavior of the original Pentecost, and neither of them capable to inspire the theology of the entire Christian tradition. Moreover, I think it is difficult to imagine a strictly confessional approach to the day of Pentecost. As the birthday of the church, Pentecost does not belong to Pentecostals. Pentecost belongs to all Christians. Pentecost as an image of Christian theology, therefore, cannot be simply developed. It must first be rediscovered. And the unfamiliar seedbed for this rediscovery that I want to explore with you for a few minutes is the theological behavior originating with the day of Pentecost. I'm proposing that the image of Pentecost can be recaptured for the theological enterprise by identifying the behavior at Pentecost as indicative of the nature of Christian theology. I use the term behavior here in distinct contrast 
to the notion of liturgy. Because the well-known theological term liturgy expresses a certain consensus of normative ecclesiastical practices. At Pentecost, however, such liturgical agreement does not yet exist in the church. Even if we assume a normative Jewish liturgy for the day of Pentecost, the church's reportedly drunken behavior confronts any such normative expectations of how we should act, how we should be. I use the term behavior, therefore, deliberately in a pre-liturgical sense to denote all ways in which Christians act or conduct themselves in response to various physical, psychological, social and environmental stimuli. The goal of this broad approach is to extend the purview of what we are to expect at Pentecost. We are to be hospitable, as hospitable as the disciples on the day itself, and not limited to a preconceived behavioral inventory or to normative liturgical expectations of some form or meaning or function. If we are willing to go that far, what kind of drunken behavior are we as Christians willing to engage? What name do we give to the behavior at Pentecost if Pentecostal is too narrowly associated with the confessional modern day movements? What universal behavior at Pentecost is applicable to the whole of Christianity? The behavior that I suggest meets these seemingly elusive demands is what we call play. This universal human behavior found in all stages of human physical, social and psychological development resonates with the challenging nature of Pentecost by offering behavioral patterns that resist fully functional, complete and structured expectations of what we might traditionally see as acceptable Christian theological behavior. <coughs> Playing is ambiguous. There is not actually one single activity that we do when we say that we play. The word play covers a range of behavior and this ambiguity is an advantage. When I suggest that at Pentecost we find theology at play, it is this ambiguous use of the notion of play that allows us to rediscover a wide range of experiences and behaviors of the church. I wish to present with play a behavior that does not suppress and alienate the fullness of life, but that offers a transcendence immersed in the imminent experience of the encounter with God. Inevitably, the highly unusual employment of play requires a rethinking of how we identify theological behavior. Do you really believe that the church plays? Do we really think that we play when we go and celebrate the liturgy? Is play really applicable? We cannot simply go to the Bible and expect to find evidence of play in literal terms, although it is there. I also suspect that the disciples on the day of Pentecost would disagree with me labeling their behavior as play. Neither can we just ask the modern day Pentecostal movements to, to show us what playful behavior is like. We must arrive at a theological definition of play, one that protects the ambiguity and universality of the behavior. But what I have suggested so far is that theological behavior does not take place as a generic activity, but remains always tied to specific forms that take place at a specific context in which they occur, a playground, if you will, and that is the place that allows play to unfold. A theological definition of play can therefore not be generalized. The church does not play always and everywhere. I suggest that we first find the church at play, the original playground at Pentecost. And since Pentecost belongs to all Christians, play manifests what you might call theology for everyone. <laughs> 
This appreciation of Pentecost as manifestation of a foundational Christian behavior calls ultimately for the much larger task to develop a corresponding behavioral theology. Its core question is, how can the behavior at Pentecost extend to all Christians? What I suggest today is that this task depends initially on the proximity to Pentecost in which we find Christian theology. In the second part of my lecture, therefore, I want to trace the links that may exist between theology and theologians today and the original Pentecost, in the hope that it will provide us with an opportunity to go out and play. So Pentecost and theology. The Christian theological traditions stand in different proximity to the day of Pentecost and will find it more or less difficult to relate to the slogan back to Pentecost. I therefore speak deliberately of theology in the image of Pentecost to indicate the challenges of proximity between present day Christianity and the original Pentecost. There are three dimensions in which we can understand this proximity and I want to label these theology at Pentecost, theology of Pentecost, and Pentecostal theology. These dimensions construct the playground for theological behavior in the image of Pentecost. So, theology at Pentecost. Well, this is theology deeply rooted and grounded in the day of Pentecost. It is theology surprise, surprise, that first happened on the day of Pentecost. And its theological behavior is tied to the historical events of the day surrounding the original outpouring of God's Spirit shortly after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Theology at Pentecost is a behavior to which the contemporary Christian does not have direct and immediate access. Since we are not the original apostles, Pentecost is strictly speaking an event in the past. And this historical distance marks the most immediate challenge for doing Pente Christian theology or theology at Pentecost today. Nonetheless, the slogan back to Pentecost is consistent with the biblical affirmation in 1 John 1, 1 to 4 that Despite any historical and geographical distance, the Christian today does have fellowship with the original disciples. When the apostle states, quote, we declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. The physical proximity to Christ, what the Apostle in verse 1 calls hearing, seeing, and touching Jesus, is the exclusive claim of the Apostles, the original disciples. And the readers of the letter did not share in this fellowship. When the writer says, we experience Jesus in that way, he does not include his audience in that we. And yet, the letter's audience is included in the fellowship because of the apostolic witness which after all begins when? At Pentecost. We must therefore take seriously that participation in the fellowship with Christ also includes the community at Pentecost. We are included in this fellowship because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as a universal gift has opened the apostolic fellowship to the future and to the world. With the words of the Apostle Peter on the day, the promise of God to pour out his spirit, quote, is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off. That means, translated, the promise includes Christian theology today. So that Pentecost is no longer tied exclusively to that original historical event and concerning only those who received the Holy Spirit on that day, but theology at Pentecost becomes a conscientious participation in the experience of the apostolic community beyond the day itself and throughout history. 
Put differently, theology at Pentecost continues with every behavior which participates in the event we call Pentecost. In this behavioral perspective, theology at Pentecost can remain grounded in and yet transcend the day of Pentecost to become a universally accessible e theological event. Well, but what event exactly do we mean when we say Pentecost? The experience of the first Pentecost as event, that is, the original moment of a theology at Pentecost, exists exactly only in the experience of the outpouring and reception of God's Spirit. Acts 2 and 4 narrates this moment with a brief description, quote, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, end of quote. That's it. That is Pentecost. The event we call Pentecost happens when the Spirit is poured out and to be filled with the Spirit is to participate in Pentecost. More precisely, the original theology at Pentecost is concentrated in the event as a pre-conceptual behavior manifested in pure expectation encounter and wonder, a letting it happen which precedes theological reflection on the experience. We have access to this event because, as the philosopher of religion John Caputo reminds us, events are uncontainable and they cannot be held captive by history or confession or doctrine. Christian theology relates to Pentecost first and foremost by participating in the event itself. The manifestation of Pentecost as divine event frees Pentecost from its historical and confessional existence of a single day because the outpouring of God's Spirit manifests an uncontainable surprise, an overflow, an excess, and a gift. Theology at Pentecost is found in the behavior of the original followers of Jesus in expectation of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise of the Spirit, which as event they could not fully comprehend because it stood always in front of them. It was always out of reach. Jesus simply instructs them to wait for the Spirit. In this oversaturation of expectation and encounter that, that, that contributes to the appearance of drunkenness, the apostles did not make happen what unfolded at Pentecost. There was nothing the church could do or plan or project but to wait for the Spirit. Theological behavior at Pentecost is pre-liturgical because it consists of anticipation and expectation <coughs> guided only by the abundant experience of the outpouring of God's Spirit. Hence, theology in the image of Pentecost today emerges from an anticipation to participate in that waiting fellowship at the original event with a shared expectation that the divine promise of the outpouring of God's Spirit will also be fulfilled in the church today. Theology at Pentecost today is in the strict sense an event in which we participate by letting it happen longing for it to happen, anticipating what might happen, without a clear understanding or concern of what kind of behavior or action might be appropriate, but with wonder and with expectation, the wonder and expectation of play. Well, if Pentecost is play, then the challenge of doing theology at Pentecost is that it originates with anticipating and waiting, a risky theological behavior. We don't like to wait. We like to write, to speak, to lecture, to talk, to tell you how it is. We know what it is and you want to know. But Pentecost is anticipating and waiting. It is risky because the risk of that anticipation as event dominates, it overwhelms, it intoxicates and often leads to exaggeration and overstatement. Just read Pentecostal periodicals. <laughs> it's an outward appearance of drunkenness, not only in the behavioral sense. Yet the Apostle Peter on the day insists that the Apostles are not drunk. The participation in Pentecost must therefore be tempered by a corresponding hermeneutic, not a sober interpretation which avoids or suppresses the risk and excess of the event altogether, but a theology of Pentecost, 
that is playful and able to accept the risk because the risk is indispensable to experiencing the event. So this leads to a theology of Pentecost. This second stage, if you will, a theology of Pentecost is a step beyond theology at Pentecost in the direction of an interpretation and a hermeneutic of the event. In light of theology at Pentecost, a theology of Pentecost takes Pentecost not merely as the historical event of a single day, but as the ontological basis of a new age, the age of the church baptized in the spirit, which has begun with the day of Pentecost. A theology of Pentecost moves into the history of the church and our own history by stipulating the event of Pentecost as the totality of presuppositions, to borrow from Martin Heidegger. The hermeneutical situation, which is necessary for any interpretation that attempts to understand the meaning of the original event. In other words, the participatory function of theology at Pentecost, made possible by anticipating and waiting, is tempered by deliberate ontological interpretation. As an ontological hermeneutic, a theology of Pentecost is compelled to disclose its own conditions of interpretation as grounded in the matters themselves, den Sachen selbst, just to get some German in here, <laughs> surrounding the original outpouring of the Spirit. So we're looking for the matters that are actually contained in the very event we call Pentecost. If we understand hermeneutics as a theological behavior, then this hermeneutic of Pentecost cannot be merely anticipating, but must be reflecting. Not only expecting what may come while still enraptured in the event, but based on what has already happened, it must endeavor now to interpret everything we see and we hear and we touch and we experience in light of the event that we call Pentecost. Theology of Pentecost succeeds as an all-interpretive worldview by postulating Pentecost as the hermeneutical horizon for all of theology throughout all of history. This existential hermeneutic looks backwards onto history through the experience of the historical spirit and forwards into history through the anticipation of the eschatological spirit. This dual hermeneutic of the already and the not yet is what finds expression in these slogans, back to Pentecost and forward to Pentecost. It is a behavior emerging from the surplus of the event of meaning with its consistent aim to take us back into the event. A theology of Pentecost moves to the event via the hermeneutical framework by which the world is to be understood. Pentecost, a hermeneutical principle disassociated from Pentecost, therefore cannot help us to interpret the event or to participate in it. The hermeneutical conditions of a theology of Pentecost are rooted in the absolute openness of Pentecost as the event of meaning, to play with Hans-Georg Gadamer. Not an objectified Pentecost, since only the truth one encounters in the experiences of the original event, to follow Gadamer further, transforms us and takes us up into the event of meaning itself. A theological behavior of Pentecost therefore cannot be mere interpretation and application from a distance, but relies on what Gadamer calls an aesthetic experience, which draws us out of ourselves and immerses us into the event. Gadamer experimented with the idea that we call this hermeneutical practice play. In seemingly contradictory fashion, play as the non-differentiation between us and the original event leads a theology of Pentecost to lose itself in the experience of the event, because it is the full intention of this hermeneutical position to join the original behavior in order to participate in its meaning. The conditions of this hermeneutical, ontological hermeneutic, are derived from participation in the theological behavior of the audience at Pentecost. So earlier we looked at the behavior of the disciples. Now the audience, uh, the biblical texts tell us that the audience shows amazement 
astonishment, bewilderment. They belong to their behavior as much as their critical desire to understand the meaning of the event. A shift occurs in the aesthetic experience of the observers. The traditional hermeneutic of consciousness, which asks with the audience in Acts 2, verse 12, hey, what does this mean? Moves to a hermeneutic of experience, now asking in verse 37, what should we do? The interpretive demand for participating in the event blurs the threshold between theology at Pentecost and theology of Pentecost by changing one's disposition towards the event from observer to participant, from interpreter to participant, and consequently alters the way in which the event is understood. The goal of ontological interpretation is no longer solely to understand the meaning of the event, but to be understood by it and to receive meaning from it. If Pentecost is play, then theology of Pentecost endeavors to reflect on and interpret the Christian life without distancing this desire for understanding from participation in the encounter with God. As an ontological hermeneutic, theology of Pentecost is pre-liturgical because it is interested in rules and regulations and the order of play primarily for the sake of participation. I don't want to look at how people play, I want to be part of it. The hermeneutic of Pentecost is playful because it over accepts the event of Pentecost in a manner that seeks the outpouring of the Spirit as a reality for the interpreter. A hermeneutic of Pentecost thus turns Pentecost as a single event of history into a symbol for Christian theology throughout history. The challenge at this point is whether our hermeneutical principle serves Pentecost or whether Pentecost serves our hermeneutical principle, whether we have objectified Pentecost into an array of hermeneutical regulations and presuppositions, or if we over accept the event and the surplus of the event in a way that makes us less the interpreter and more the interpreted, less the observer and more the participant. Christian theology faces the question, what method is appropriate for this theological task? That is, what formative behavior exists that allows us today to remain immersed in the event we call Pentecost? Here, we arrive finally at what I call Pentecostal theology. We arrive at Pentecostal theology through a theology at Pentecost, which seeks participation in Pentecost as event, and through a theology of Pentecost, which is based on the hermeneutical principle that Pentecost as symbol allows us to experience and understand the world in light of the baptism with God's Spirit. Pentecost as symbol indicates a certain distance from the original event, and yet a symbol is not an autonomous idea. As Gadamer again would insist, as symbol, Pentecost depends on a physical presence which presupposes a metaphysical connection to the experiences of the original event. Pentecost as symbol shares in the event it represents by making present again the inexhaustible po uh, possibilities of participating in the outpouring of God's Spirit at any time and in any place. Pentecost not only backwards and forwards, but everywhere. This kind of theology of Pentecost as symbol has led to a confessional Pentecostal theology that is clearly seen among the Pentecostal movements, which have taken Pentecost as the symbol of their often criticized Pentecostal theological behavior. However, since the inexhaustible possibilities of Pentecost as event manifest a universal gift, the behavioral response of Pentecostal theology must be universally Pentecostal, beyond confessional identities. A non-confessional Pentecostal theology is in a strict sense found in any perpetual theological behavior that aims at directing theology towards participation in Pentecost. 
Significantly, the history of the Pentecostal movements illustrates the continuing resistance of the traditional churches to many of the unexpected, unusual, unruly, drunken behavior of the Pentecostal churches. Be it the more common forms of speaking with tongues, prophecy, shouting and dancing, or the more rare revivalist forms of laughing or being slain in the spirit. I'll tell you about that later. These patterns of behavior were born in the pre-liturgical anticipation of a theology at Pentecost represented by the apostles and the interpretation of a theology of Pentecost represented by the audience. Perpetuating these behaviors by joining both groups, even at the risk of appearing drunk, is the heartbeat of a willingness to engage in what we call play. Yet it is clear that a playful Pentecostal theology, born from the anticipation and interpretation of Pentecost, ultimately faces the task of perpetuation and regulation of the theological behavior or what we theologically identify as liturgy. Christian theology can be labeled as playful only if play is manifested as its universal liturgical spirit. As the pioneer of liturgical reform, Romano Guardini, already postulated over a hundred years ago, play as the spirit of the Christian liturgy frees theology from accusations of controlling, conceptualizing, regulating, or confessionalizing Pentecost, but also from a mere accidental arrival by placing the emphasis on liturgy as a deliberate behavioral perpetuation and response to Pentecost, and thus to the event and its overflow and to its interpretation for the sake of what? Participating in the outpouring of God's spirit that marks the original event. A universal Pentecostal liturgy goes beyond a confessional Pentecostal behavior by stipulating that all theological behavior is transformed and enriched when brought into the presence of Pentecost. Whereas theology at Pentecost is pure event in the sense that it cannot be produced but only expected and anticipated. And whereas a theology of Pentecost is an aesthetic consciousness of having experienced the event so that it can be understood, Pentecostal theology is a liturgy that aims at renewing Christian theology continuously in the image of Pentecost. This liturgy unfolds in cultivating the formative behavior, the culture, context, traditions, actions, and beliefs of the community which has encountered and interpreted Pentecost. If Pentecost is play, then Pentecostal theology in this sense is the perpetuating and cultivating of all theological behavior that presupposes and produces the effective desire to overcome the distance between us, wherever we are and whoever we are, and the original Pentecost. In order to immerse Christian theology completely and entirely in the presence of God's Spirit. With this aim, we have arrived closest to the limits of what can be said about our proximity to Pentecost, or at least what I can say about it at the moment. Pentecostal theology has little interest in a liturgical performance of formative theological behavior, unless this challenges our institutions, our communities, and our cultures to be transformed by Pentecost, to be carried away by the play of the Spirit into the presence of God. In the encounter with God, liturgy is taken up by the event itself and transformed into worship. And that is the proper end of all Pentecostal theology. I must therefore come to a conclusion. I have argued that Christian theology has neglected Pentecost and that its rediscovery points to the importance of integrating Pentecost in the behavioral patterns of theology as event, hermeneutic, and liturgy. However, the inherent connections that I have drawn between these three, the proximity to Pentecost, to event, hermeneutic, and liturgy, can not be taken for granted.
Event, hermeneutic, and liturgy do not stand in a necessary causal relationship when the event of having encountered God does not lead to a foundational Christian hermeneutic, then Pentecost as event remains only an isolated encounter with no fundamental impact on one's theological trajectory. Even more difficult, Pentecostal theology it demands the transition from ontological hermeneutics to liturgy, impossible if we regulate the behavior of Pentecost without seeking freely and playfully to participate in the event of meaning. Transformed and shaped by Pentecost, Christian liturgy cannot serve its own rituals and regulations, disconnected from the outpouring of God's Spirit. Only when event, hermeneutic and liturgy meet together to form a theological behavior that moves freely between them back and forth to Pentecost, can we speak of theology more fully in the image of Pentecost. What remains for me now is to show that underlying this Christian behavioral theology is indeed the theological behavior that we call play. But that is for another time. <laughs> for today, I hope that my brief presentation has just challenged us that we can rediscover Pentecost for the whole of Christian theology, or at least for ourselves. I suspect that most of us are reluctant and perhaps apprehensive about approaching theology in a playful mood and manner. But I expect that if we pursue theology in ways that lead to Pentecost, that our encounter with God will help us appreciate that Christian theology can indeed be play. Thank you for your attention.